Welcome to Sunday evening Bible study. We're in the book of Acts chapter 9. You can follow along in your Bible. I'm going to give you a uh, review of some of the chapters tonight and then go on and finish, hopefully finish the rest of Acts chapter 9 that we have not said anything about yet. I have it on the screen, as you can see, a uh, simple outline of, of this chapter. And uh, I have given it three divisions. The first has to do with the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, and that's the first 30 verses. And then there's one of Luke's summary statements, the progress of the unhindered gospel that he's talking about in Acts. The, uh, the story of Acts is about a gospel that is unhindered. Another way of saying it is that you can't stop the word of God. And so he has these summaries at certain points. And Acts 9.31 is the second, no, it's the third summary uh, in the book of Acts. And I'll read it in a minute. And then the third section of this chapter is what we'll concentrate on tonight. And this is about the ministry of Peter in the coastlands of Israel which is uh, a, a sort of a beginning of uh, Peter as a, as a missionary. That's, that's my version of it anyway. Chapter 6 of Acts starts with the complaints that arose in the church from the Hellenistic Jews. And this was a complaint against the Hebraic Jews. And it resulted in the election of the seven. In Acts, they're never called deacons. We call them deacons, or we call them elders, or we call them several things. But they're, in Acts, they're called the seven. And they were elected to solve the problem in the church between the Hebraic Jews and the Hellenistic widows being fed correctly. And so you had the election of, this, of the seven by the whole church. Uh, Luke emphasizes that everybody in the church got a chance to have their say. And I have printed here on the screen, you see right there where my cursor is, these are the qualifications for those men that I have found. And that is, uh, and, and this, is, this statement here is not necessarily one of those in Acts, it's in other places, but there's men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And, they, and the apostle said, this is good, and we will turn this over to them to handle. And they did, and the uh, summary statement in the sixth chapter of Acts says that after this happened, there was peace and the church grew and, and the ministry multiplied. And in that chapter, you have the beginning of the ministry of the seven, and we call him the deacon Stephen, and this is the ministry of Stephen, the outstanding one, apparently, of those seven men, and they were all outstanding. We just don't have any report from Luke about very many of them. As a matter of fact, Stephen and Philip is about all we've got, but Stephen was really outstanding. And Luke reported to us that he did signs and wonders among the people of Jerusalem. And he got quite a reputation and he went into the synagogues. And in the synagogues of the freedmen, well, they thought they knew more than Stephen and they couldn't prove it. And they wound up short and so they brought charges against Stephen. And so he was arrested and put on trial. And in Act 7, you have the message that Stephen gave to the Sanhedrin in answer to those charges. And if you'll remember, I told you there were three basic charges and the, he was charged with violating what they thought of as the three pillars on which Judaism stood. And that is on the Holy Land and on the law of Moses and on the temple that God has allowed us to build and where we worship 
and where we have the Ark of the Covenant, and I, my version of that is, is where we think we've got God in our box. And that was the trouble that Stephen spoke against, and that is the trouble that caused Stephen to be stoned to death, and basically on charges of his own kind in that the Hellenistic Jews are the ones that brought the complaint against the Judaistic Jews who were what they thought were the only Hebrews, but these people were, were from the scattering of the Jews over the, over the lands, and when they came back to the Holy Land, they were speaking Greek and not Aramaic, which was the language of the Jews in Jerusalem. So you have a difference in language and a difference of background, and they are the ones that really opposed Stephen and caused his death in Jerusalem and up to chapter 7 the book of Acts is about the church in Jerusalem because they thought that it was a, an exclusive Jewish thing that Jesus was born of the Jews of the line of David and so forth and Luke is the one that told us that Jesus had a lineage that goes back to Adam, not just to, not just to David. And so there's, there's this difference. And the church had to learn better than that they were tied to the temple and to the synagogue. And Acts is a story of how the church not only had to break loose from the temple, and from the synagogue, but had to break loose from its own prejudice against its own breakout. And Stephen was the, is the first advocate that we know of taking the gospel to all people. And that's behind what happened to it. So persecution began in the eighth chapter. And it says that Stephen was buried and good men mourned over him greatly. And Saul is one of those who really was a, a Hellenistic Jew from out, he was from Tarsus, which is not even, even near the Holy Land. It's in, today it's in Turkey. And so we have a Hellenistic Jew pursuing the missionaries from the church who were really all Hellenistic Jews. And in tonight's chapter, this business about Peter getting out and being a missionary himself outside of Jerusalem is a new thing. But we did get in chapter 8 that Philip was sent by an angel to proclaim the gospel in Samaria. And remember the, in the first verses of Acts, Luke reported that Jesus told them that you will remain in Jerusalem and you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, the promised Holy Spirit and the power will come upon you. And you then, and I, and I put the word then in there, then after that has happened, you will be my witnesses, Jesus said, in Jerusalem. And that's where we've been up till now in, in, in this in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And apparently Stephen is the first one in the church who really advocated that with force. And so when he was killed, persecution started and Saul of Tarsus sought to destroy the church. And Luke reports that the disciples were scattered here and there and yonder. But and this is a curious thing, and, I'm, and my, I'll give you my explanation. The apostles were not run out of town in this. Well, why weren't they? Well, in the first place, they weren't the uh, Greek-speaking Jews. They were Aramaic-speaking Jews, and they weren't. The apostles at this time were not advocating the gospel to the whole world. For, for instance, uncircumcised Gentiles. That thing was a death penalty to, to advocate that, to bring that into Israel. And so Stephen died, more or less, advocating that. 
and a gospel took a hold of the second one of the seven, Philip, and said, go down to Samaria. And so he did. And the church found out about it that, hey, there he's, who is he talking to down there? So they sent Peter and John down there to check on that thing. And when they got down there, they saw that these people that, that uh, Philip had brought the gospel to had the Holy Spirit just like they did in Jerusalem. Well, this was a new vision to that, to, to Peter and John, according to what I read in Luke. And so they began to pray with the new believers and to pray for them. And uh, the, the, well, I, did I say that, the, that they had already received the Holy Spirit? Well, it said, Luke said they had not until Peter and John went down there and prayed over them and laid their hands on them. And, and we've made a, a lot of that. But the point is that Peter and John got out of Jerusalem for the first time and they're in Samaria and they're helping create a church down there. So the gospel in that chapter, in chapter 8, has spread out of Jerusalem for the first time. And that's the significance of it. And that's the significance of Philip and that Ethiopian unit. The, you can know that an Ethiopian unit had his body mutilated in a, in a way that the, that the law of Moses forbade and he could not be uh, considered a true Jew. And Philip goes down there and tells the gospel to this man and they're in the desert, but they come to water, and there is water in that desert. I showed you pictures of that when we were doing this. And the man said, what prevents, what hinders me from being baptized? And that goes along with Luke's word, unhindered. And the point about that eunuch is that the law hindered him. But the gospel is unhindered, and there was nothing that hindered him being baptized. And it says that Philip baptized him, and he went on his way rejoicing. And then, in this same chapter, Philip then goes toward uh, Caesarea up the coast, and he is the first in Luke to take the gospel to the coastland. And so he goes up the coast, to Caesarea and stops there and we find that he lived there and had uh, had a certain number of daughters I've forgotten the exact number but uh, it says that those daughters were prophets and that means that they spread the gospel is what that really means so Philip is the first one who went to the coastlands and in tonight's chapter we are going to cover Peter going over some of the same territory behind him and there are churches already there but there's still people to be converted and so that's what we're into tonight now in chapter 9 I told you the three areas you have the conversion of Saul of Tarsus now the unhindered gospel the story of the unhindered gospel talks about that no opposition can stop the gospel and of all the opposition that existed, Saul was the worst possible enemy. He had the authority of the chief priest in Jerusalem to go to Damascus. And, and I'm remembering the words, he, had the, 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 he was empowered to arrest and put in chains to, to bring bound to Jerusalem those followers of the way that he could find there, both men and women. Can you imagine a fanatic who's willing to bind women and drag them 100, over 150 miles over desert and bad roads just because he, agrees with, he disagrees with their theology? And that's who Saul was, the worst enemy the church saw. And if he had not been stopped, he might have wiped out the church. And this is a man that was a great theologian. He was trained by the best that the teachers that Israel had to offer. And he said so many times. He said, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel, and that's the best they had during his lifetime, besides Jesus himself, that is. And so 
a heavenly light comes on Saul on the road and he is converted. And so we went through how the Lord came to Aeneas and, um, well, the Lord told him, Aeneas, go in there and put your hands on the man and restore his sight because I've chosen him to represent me before the Gentiles and kings and everybody else. And the man tried to talk God out of it. He said, oh, this man is trying to kill us as if God didn't know that. And so God promised him that he would show Saul what he had to suffer. And, and I say that that meant that Saul was going the one doing the suffering for the church. And it sure happened that way. And so Saul then began to preach in Damascus and they ran him out of Damascus, and I showed you slides about uh, about that and the king that was really after him. And uh, so he went to Jerusalem, and we talked about how in Jerusalem they were scared to death of him and wouldn't receive him. And so Barnabas, and here's Barnabas again, the one who uh, you had, some of you had a Sunday school lesson today uh, that, in, that talked about Barnabas and how good he was and how honest he was and what a leader he was. And his very name means son of consolation. And wherever Barnabas went, he made friends and made peace and got them working together. And so when Saul, the greatest enemy the church had, showed up back at Jerusalem, they wouldn't touch him until Barnabas vouched for him and then they accepted him. And then the Hellenistic Jews rolls up against Saul in Jerusalem. And so the brethren didn't want any trouble. So it says they took him down to Caesarea and put him on a ship and sent him off to Tarsus. And so Saul's out of the picture now in chapter nine. And so we have this summary statement in 931. I'll read it in a minute. And now we take up Peter's ministry in the coastland in Luda and the plain of Sharon and what's today Tel Aviv Yafo or Yafo Yafa. So Aeneas is healed at Luda. That's Lud and not Lod as it's written in our book. Anytime you find a Y in the Greek, it's pronounced with a U. So it's Lud or Luda. And this man had been paralyzed for eight years, and so Peter restored him. And then he goes to Dorcas, and she is raised from the dead at Joppa. And then Peter stays with Simon the Tanner at Joppa for a time. And that is the introduction to chapter 10, where Peter goes to the centurion and a room full of Gentiles and spreads is the gospel to them and they receive the Holy Spirit and Peter makes a statement and that's in chapter 10 which we will take up next time hopefully we'll take it up next time and Peter said these folks have received the Holy Spirit what hinders us from baptizing them that's, that's a statement that's probably a misquote but close so you had the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and there's a resume of it and then at the bottom of the page is Acts 9.31, the summary statement after this event about Saul. Then, so that word then is an important word. Luke put it in there to let you know that all that happened. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. What's this about a church outside of Judea? Have we gotten any word that there's a church in Galilee yet? The answer is no. Luke has never mentioned any church nor any missionary going to Galilee at all. But there it is. The church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. And there is Luke's version after 
overcoming the opposition of Saul and his cutthroats that he had, and that, that was an expedition, not just Saul by himself. Don't ever think that Saul was going to Damascus by himself. It was an expedition, and he had a bunch of Jewish soldiers. Some people would call them thugs, but whatever it was, they had blood on their mind against the way, and they were stopped by that light and, and the identity of the one that sent it, and that is Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And when Jesus said, whom, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, well, Saul thought he was persecuting the way. And Jesus said, you're persecuting me. Well, that is a lesson about, against any persecutor against the church. They're not taking on just the church, they're taking on Jesus himself. There's the lesson in that one. So there's the summary statement. Now I'm going to examine that a little bit. This meanwhile, and, and so things are still going on in other places that we don't know about. And, you, and number two there, the first mention in Acts of the churches in Galilee. And then you have this about living in fear of the Lord. What does that mean? Well, we're supposed to live in a fear of the Lord in that we need to know that we, you cannot get away with your own foolishness without forgiveness from the Lord. If there's no forgiveness, then you've got something to fear. And so that's the way they live. And in spite of all, the fourth thing there is in spite of all the, that the opposition could do, the churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria increased in numbers. More churches, more believers, and them living godly lives. That's the summary. And so I have it here in more than one version just to give you an idea of how many ways that can be put. In the NIV it says the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria implying that there's only one organization. Well, that's not true to the way Luke wrote it. The New King James has got then the churches and that's what they were. And that is they were each church was, it was on its own and they had to exist through the power of the Holy Spirit and what in the way that they could exist in the community where they were. Does that sound like about who we are? That's who we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to have to answer to any man that's not a member of this church besides the Lord. And so the word church is used, and you see there, number one, all those translations? Well, that's, that goes back to the original King James writers, and they said the church. Well, the churches is in the New King James principally. And then in others, I, and I've got them here, it calls them the assemblies. And the word for church in Greek does mean the assembly. And in this case, it's plural, the assemblies. And I have a translation here from the Hebrew names version of the New Testament. And I'll read it out loud. So the assemblies throughout all Yahuda and Galil and Shamran had shalom and were built up. They were multiplied walking in fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Ruach HaKodesh. And I don't know if I got the Hebrew right or not, but I, do you get the idea that that there is a Jewish Christian church out there that understands that those words better than we do. And so in Darby's translation in verse 31, it's read, it, it reads this way. The assemblies then throughout the whole of Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace, being edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and were increased through the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So the church, the ecclesia, an assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. That's the definition that's in the book. And it means a congregation or an assembly. Or it also means 
And I can tell you this, that I happen to, to have been at the Southern Baptist Convention in 1964 in Atlantic City, New Jersey, when we debated a change to the Baptist faith and message. And there were people there that said, oh, if you weren't baptized by one of our preachers, you can't participate in the Lord's Supper and, you, and you're, you're not a Baptist. And, and there are even some Baptists that said that since uh, John the Baptist baptized Jesus, that means Jesus was a Baptist. And if, uh, if, if you weren't baptized one of one of us, you're not even saved. And the Church of Christ broke away from Baptists because we said, hey, there's something wrong with that. And I'll tell you what we adopted. I heard the debate, and that was the debate, and it was settled this way, and I got to vote for it. And it, de it defined the church as made up of all the saved of all the ages. And there are people that today that'll say, oh, that can't be. Well, what else is it? If they weren't saved, then when are they gonna get saved? If there was no saved people then, uh, who are we? Well, I say that we were right in saying that the church is made up of all the saved, of all the ages. And that is a decision not made by any church. That's a decision made by God himself. You can't get into God's kingdom without God's permission. Some people think you can break in. Uh, your lesson this morning about Ananias and Sapphira uh, said you can't buy it. You can't break in that way. And you had a, you had a, the, a magician that tried to buy it in and, and the disciples Peter and John straighten him out in a hurry too. So here's a map of Israel where Peter's going and I've kind of got it marked here. You see I've got Damascus up there. Well that's over here. That's Damascus right in there on the other side of Mount Hermon out in the desert on, on, an, ace, on a, um, an oasis filled with a river that runs off of Mount Hermon that snows up there year round and the the snow melt gave them an oasis of water. And that's where Paul, was, uh, Saul of Tarsus, was headed and was saved. And that's a long way from Jerusalem, which is way down here. And I didn't even mark that on the map, but that's not part of the story here. I just marked Damascus. And the plain of Sharon is right in here in this area, that big area right there on the map of Israel. I, I need to magnify this for you, don't I? That area there, a, a part of Samaria and, and a part of Judea is the plain of Sharon. And this is where Peter is gonna go. And uh, he is going to stay, you see Joppa right there? And Ludda or Lud is where my, see where that three is? Well, that's not really there to mark that, but it happens to be about where the town is. So Peter has left Jerusalem up here in these mountains and has gone down in toward the, the plain, the, the, the sea, sea coast plain lands and below the hills into the flat country to to be with the churches that are down there that uh, Philip may have been the one that founded those churches. We don't really know who, who opened up all these churches. So that's where we are. And I'll show you something else. This is a modern map. I've had, it's not modern anymore. That, I've had that map for 40 years, but that is the highways that exist in Israel and it is confusing. But you see right here where my cursor is, that's Lud, and that is what's Tel Aviv, Yafo, 40 years ago, and it's, everything's twice that size now or more. And this is the main highway then, and it gives you the miles, basically. It, the Latrun exit gets you to, load, to Lud up there, about 15 miles, and this is at Tel Aviv. 
and we're in the plain of Sharon. You see the flat land and you see the hills up there. Jerusalem is up in those hills. You climb away from this land all the way up to Jerusalem. And here's another map of the same thing. That's the Dead Sea. Jerusalem is in here. And uh, I need to magnify that too, don't I? Now, there's Lude plain to you on the map. You see it? And down here, uh, that 14 miles or so, and remember that Peter is probably walking, uh, either that or he's a, he's a horse rider, but uh, there's Joppa down there. And the centurion of chapter 10 is 60 miles away up there in Caesarea. You see Caesarea there on the coast? So now you've got the lay of the land. You can see the mountains and the hills up there and then you can see down here there's no wrinkles. That's, that's the coastlands where Peter is in tonight's story. In chapter 8, Philip carried the gospel to the coastlands. And it says that he worked from Azotus, which is where down there below Lude, north to Caesarea, about 60 miles. And I'll read you the verse. Uh, Acts 8, 39. Now when they came up out of the water, this is when he baptized the uh, eunuch, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Well, that is the eunuch went on his way rejoicing that he had been saved. And Philip was found at Azotus. And so passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Well, that's 60 miles up that coast. And this is where Peter is going now to follow up. And so in Acts 9, the third section, Peter goes to visit the Lord's people in the plain of Sharon. Acts 9, 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the Lord's people who lived in Luda. Well, that's an interesting phrase, the Lord's people. We don't know whether any of them were Gentiles or not, but we do know that this country used to be Philistia. It was the Philistines. And now the Jews are in it, and they're, and they're both there. The, the Gentiles are there and the Jews are there and when it says the Lord's people well you've got to ask yourself well were there any Gentiles in that church I don't know there he found a man named Aeneas actually where you see an A-E in the Latin and the Greek it's pronounced I Aeneas he was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Aeneas, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up. There's that phrase again. Remember how important the word get up is. Get up and roll up your mat. Immediately, Aeneas got up. All those who lived in Luda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. And that is an interesting statement that uh, is subject to interpretation. So this is Philistine territory, the coastland. And so Peter is moving down there among God's people. And he has reached this community and this Aeneas must have been one of the saints. And he, uh, he is someone who had been bedridden for eight years there. And Peter comes down there by the power of the Holy Spirit and commands him. And he doesn't say, I heal you or anything like that. He says, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up. Roll up your mat. And a man of faith understood that. And a man that did not have faith did not understand that. Now in the case where Peter is, was at the temple and healed the lame man who was over 40 years old, been lame from birth, when he 
healed him. The man had never walked, so he took him by the hand and helped him get up. This man had been lame for only eight years, not all his life. And so he just told him to get up, and he got up. In Acts, these signs and miracles had a distinct purpose, and it was not to show off the apostles or any of that, the purpose for, for winning lost people and convincing them that Jesus Christ was real. They had a power that we don't exercise. And I say the reason we do is because we have free will and people have a reputation in the churches of claiming Christ and misusing the gift of the power of God. Y'all ever seen the power of God misused? Well, it has been. Churches get into fights all the time. The Southern Baptist Convention, which is I've been proud all my life to be part of that, and they're in a fight now, and part of it is just somebody's misusing their office. Ascalon, or Azotus, that's where this, is, this farmland is, and this is the farm treasure house of Israel, and you can see Jesus talked about the fields being white for harvest. Well, <laughs> there's one of them. And this is the coastland. This is a picture of Herzliya and the coast north of Tel Aviv, which is Joppa. So that <coughs> land up there is on the road to Caesarea where Peter is going to go in the 10th chapter to meet the centurion. But this is the plain where Peter is ministering now. And it goes north to Mount Carmel which uh, in that dim mist up there, you can, you can just barely make out something that looks like a mountain range, and that's Mount Carmel. That's, uh, that's where the, they had that situation with the prophets of Baal back in the Old Testament and so forth. That's where Megiddo is, that's where Megiddo Pass is, where Pharaoh, Necho, killed King Josiah and so forth, right up that road from Egypt and so this is the coast and it's pretty rough and you can see that the waves coming in are pretty rough the United States Navy found that out recently did they not when they put that dock in there in Israel it's, it washed away and we're having to take it down and that that water there is very treacherous and here's the coastland uh, that, that picture is not as new as it could be, but Israel is a built-up country now. It's not farmland like that all over the place. You have industry everywhere. It's an industrial nation, but I guarantee you they got to eat and they raise their food, and they certainly know how. <clears throat> They've got some of the most wonderful farms in the world on that land. Here's Aphek, uh, which I'll not go into what that is. But this is a picture again of the main highway going to Jerusalem from Joppa. And so verse 36, in Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha or Tabitha. And in Greek her name is Dorcas or Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. And the significance of her being washed is that these are Jews, and when somebody died, they washed their body and uh, placed them and put spices on them and wrapped them so forth for burial. And so they have prepared her for, bur for her burial. And uh, Luda was near Joppa in the text, and, and the near means 14 miles. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Luda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. That's the NIV. Now, remember that Philip had led the way and he also had taken part in breaking down the wall between the Gentiles and the Jews. And so some of these could have been Gentiles here. And so Peter now has become a witness to Jesus and a participant on this new mission, and this is really, uh, some people consider this Samaria. And so Dorcas 
had a significant ministry of doing good and helping the poor. And uh, Luke is telling you that in the early church, the women did their part. But she died, and they prepared her body. And hearing about Peter and Luda healing Aeneas, well, they sent for him, and he came. Verse 38. Uh, Luda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Luda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. And Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the, window, all the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. And apparently she had made these things and given them to them. And some of it, we're not told, but it has been speculated that some of that was her own clothing that she gave away. You've heard about people that'll give you the shirt off of their back. Well, here's an example. And so the widows that she helped were there mourning for her. And that was part of the Jewish tradition also. And they could certainly get the town's attention with their, with their mourning out loud and they showed Peter these things that she had made and given to him and they they had suffered a great loss when this woman was taken by death Peter verse 40 Peter sent them all out of the room then he got down on his knees and prayed now Luke did not leave that out Peter if he told this to Luke did not claim that he healed this woman or raised her from the dead it says that Peter got down on his knees and prayed. And turning toward the de dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. There's that word again. <laughs> she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers. Now, these are called believers here especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. So the, we have these examples of what these miracles are and how they were done. They were done in the name of Jesus. No one claimed that they had done them, but that the Lord had done it. And this is like what happened in Mark chapter 5 verse 40 where Jesus in the house of Jairus raised the man's daughter it's the same scenario and he ordered to get up in Luke 7 13 we have this text when the Lord saw her his heart went out to her and he said don't cry then he went up and touched the bier that they were carrying him on, and the bearer stood still, and he said, Young man, I say to you, get up. And this is where he raised the widow's son at Naim. So Peter took her by the hand and helped her up and presented her alive to the believers and to the widows. And all over Joppa, and there's one of those little summaries that Luke, uh, Luke puts in. There's seven of them that are special and, and programmed. But this one is just kind of a matter of fact sort of thing that all over Joppa people believed in the Lord. Well, of course they did. They better. There is a picture that I made a long time ago of the house that they say is the entrance. That's the entrance to what they say. If you go to the Holy Land and want to see Simon the Tanner's house, they've got it. There it is. And so that's what they showed me. And Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, that's a curious thing because tanning is a thing that's unclean. And if you don't think so, uh, y'all remember me wearing a vest in here in the wintertime? Mm -hmm. I wear a vest. I bought that vest when I was in Macedonia on a mission over there during that war. And I decided that I wanted to buy 
some leather goods before I came back and I got off the paved streets out on the dirt streets there in the city and followed my nose and sure enough I found the tanner and I walked in there and he was tanning the hides and he was had a guy on a sewing machine and he was making the stuff that I bought and when you see me in that vest that's where I got it from directly from the tanner and I can tell you that their store does not smell very pleasant. And the Jews considered that uh, unclean. And so there at that place, chapter nine, verse 11, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. Well, Luke is good about giving you the address of where somebody lives. Mm -hmm. And in 17, they rounded up some bad characters from the market marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city, and they rushed to Jason's house. Now, there's a, another identification of a guy's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they find, did not find them there, they dragged out Jason and some other believers before the city officials shouting, these men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them in his house. And isn't this the guys that were shouting, great is Diana of the Ephesians, isn't that the place? I think it was, but anyway, Luke is telling you where things happen. And so that's why I showed you that picture. I, I don't know whether that's a man's authentic house or not, but leave it to Luke to tell you where things happen to make it sound true. And this is, is the house of the picture that I took. So we come now to the end of chapter nine and we're at the first verse of Acts, the 10th chapter. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. And so Peter, and I'll go on, and, and I'm not going to go into chapter 10 very much here, besides just to talk a little bit. But you're going to see, by the way Luke tells this, that the Lord had to come to Peter in a vision and tell him, don't you declare anything unclean that I say is clean. And he had to tell him three times. And at the third time, that man's messengers were knocking at his door and said that there's this centurion down there that Caesarea has had a vision for us to come up here and talk to you and for you to come down there and tell us the gospel. And Peter himself went down there and told him, he said, you all know now that I as a Jew are not even supposed to be in this house or eat with you at all. And yet the Lord told me to come and so here I am. And what do y'all want to know? And so that's what we're going to get into in chapter 10. And the point I want to make with you is that if you think that the 12 apostles are the ones who carried the gospel to the world, well, they, they did it kick, kicking and screaming is my version of it. Those seven men who came from the world, who were Greek speakers, are the ones that put them on it. And the death of Stephen kicked it off. And there's speculation among theologians that the Apostle Paul, who saw Stephen die for this cause, was never quite the same fanatic, that he had a guilt in him, that he had seen a man die for the gospel, and that was new. And he was after something that was supernatural. And so when the Lord came to Paul on the Damascus road, he was ready to be convinced. And so all of this fits like a glove. And the apostles, when they stayed in Jerusalem during the time of the persecution and all these other Hellenistic Jews had to leave. And you'll find later in Acts, it says that some of them went to Antioch and it tells you where those people were from, and they were not from Jerusalem. Not a one of them was mentioned from Jerusalem, if I remember right. 
They were all Hellenistic Jews from out there, speak, Greek speakers. And they went to Antioch and they spread the gospel to uncircumcised Gentiles. And the church heard about it. And, and my version of it is that they didn't send Barnabas up there to, to uh, say glory to God. They sent Barnabas up there to straighten it out. And when Barnabas got there, the Luke says he was glad. And instead of straightening them out, he joined in with them. And it wasn't too long till he went up to Tarsus and told old Saul, hey man, you gotta come down here where we are in Antioch. The Holy Spirit's at work and it's a working and you've got to help us. And that's Barnabas went and got Paul and they eventually were sent out by that church as the first missionaries to the world. And even Paul finally had to come to a decision. And you'll find it, and I'll, I'll be able to quote it, and I'll get into all that, but Paul had to be persuaded finally after he tried to argue all those details with those trained Greek philosophers at Athens. He said, from now on, I'm not going to preach anything among y'all except Jesus and him crucified. And then another time he said, and I go to the Gentiles. And when he went back in the 15th chapter of Acts to argue with them about the Gentiles, and who was he arguing with? The very church at Jerusalem that founded all this, but did not send out these missionaries, according to Luke, with much enthusiasm. They did it, but kind of kicking and screaming. And in the 10th chapter, you have Peter, who the Lord came to him in a vision and commanded him to get up out from there and go and the men were knocking on his door when he woke up. And so he goes down there and tells them that I, it's not fit for me to be here, but God sent me anyway, and so what do y'all want to know? And, that, and there you go. So that is what we will get into next week. And so I'm going to take the liberty to stop this at this time and ask y'all for your questions if you have any. <coughs> May God add his blessings. Yes. Megiddo? Yeah. That is uh, the place in history where that they now call Armageddon, where the final battle in Revelation will be fought at Armageddon. That's yeah. at Megiddo. Yeah. And that's over those mountains just past that plain that I showed you and I talked about the mountains. That's right on the other side of the mountain. Yeah, because I've seen a movie uh, Megiddo and I was wondering what that meant. Well, that's not ghetto. That's me ghetto. Me ghetto. Me ghetto, it's not even ghetto, it's different words. Thank you for the question. Are there other questions? Let us pray. We thank you, our Father, for what you do for us with the power of the Holy Spirit. Forgive us when we fall short. Forgive us when we misuse your power. Teach us how to serve you better. Teach us how to use the power that you give us Teach us how to know what is clean for us and help us to go do it and not reluctantly but joyfully and help us to succeed at what you send us to do. For it's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen.